Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to our rollout of our newest paper, The Next Frontier UAVs for Great Power Conflict. I'm Dave Deptula, the Dean of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Power Studies. Uh, and I'm really excited about this because the Air Force is about to make its most significant change to force design in decades. Secretary of the Air Force's Frank Kendall uh, has made it a top priority to rapidly field autonomous collaborative platforms or ACPs to offset serious force structure shortfalls and build a war winning force. The president's 2024 budget request will include a significant funding increase for a new ACP variant known as the Collaborative Combat Aircraft, or CCA, which will partner with inhabited systems for air dominance missions. Now, the paper we're releasing today aims to move the ball forward by identifying key ACP capabilities and concepts, as well as opportunities and challenges ahead. It focuses on how ACPs can support penetrating strike missions, and given the recent B-21 rollout and the importance of that system to U.S. deterrence, I can't think of a better mission area to be focusing on as we move into the next frontier of uninhabited aircraft innovation. Now, we'll dive into the details in just a moment, but before we do, let me introduce our all-star lineup. We have six panelists for you today, who are at the center of our Air Force's CCA effort and are teaming across and with industry to make it a reality. From the Air Force, we have two key players. Major General Scott Job is the Director of Plans, Programs, and Requirements, Headquarters Air Combat Command. ACC is the lead command for CCA, and Major General Job is responsible for defining requirements for CCAs and leading the efforts associated with fielding them across the Air Force. Brigadier General Dale White is a program executive officer for fighters and advanced aircraft at the Air Force Life Cycle Management Center at the Air Force Materiel Command. In this role, Brigadier General White leads the acquisition efforts associated with CCA. Next, we have two senior industry leaders in ACP development who come from companies with tremendous history and experience in fielding uninhabited systems. David Alexander is the president of the Aircraft Systems Group of General Atomics Aeronautical Systems, the main supplier of combat UAVs for the United States Air Force for more than two decades and a major player in ACP development with its new Gambit ACP design. Steve Finley is the president of the Unmanned Systems Division of Kratos Defense and Security Solutions a leading aerial target drone manufacturer and producer of the XQ-58, an experimental stealthy UAV at the vanguard of Air Force ACP development. Finally, last but not least, from Mitchell Institute, we have Dr. Caitlin Lee, the director of the Center of UAV and Autonomy Studies and retired Colonel Mark Gonzo Gunzinger. These two have spent the last several months distilling insights from a major Mitchell Institute event that brought together Air Force operators, engineers, and scientists to sort out what ACPs might bring to the fight in a great power conflict. We've got a lot to cover today, so let's get right to it. Caitlin and Gonzo, could you please give the audience a brief overview of the findings from our study? And then what we'll do is move into a roundtable discussion with our panelists. So Caitlin and Gonzo, over to you. Thanks, General Deptula. Um, such a pleasure to be here today with this great panel. Um, Gonzo and I are just really thrilled to have all of you participate. Uh, my name again is Caitlin Lee. I lead the Center for UAV and Autonomy Studies here. And I wanna step back and talk to you a little bit about why we focus on this topic. Since the end of the Cold War, budget pressure has forced the Air Force to shed capacity, capability, and readiness to a point it must now largely rely on smaller numbers of advanced systems and a shrinking overseas posture. We all know the threat that China poses to US national security, and the Air Force is looking for ways to offset its force structure shortfalls and present a combat credible force. Air Force leaders are making major investments in advanced weapon systems. These include hypersonic weapons, fighters, and of course, our new long range bomber, the B-21. 
But to turn the tables on China, the Air Force needs to introduce more mass, survivability, lethality into the battle space quickly. So it is trying to do something radically new. It is building a new generation of low cost autonomous UAVs known as Autonomous Collaborative Platforms or ACPs. There's been a lot of attention on the new B-21 and rightly so given its central role in war fighting and deterrence. But much less has been said about the family of systems it was always designed to operate with. Today, Gonzo and I wanna share with you our new report, which focuses on how ACPs might contribute to a family of systems for penetrating strike missions. I encourage you, of course, to read the report, um, which is available on our website, and we'll put it in the chat link. But just to get to the punchline, a central insight of our work is that large numbers of low-cost ACPs can provide a decisive advantage for penetrating strike missions. They can increase bomber survivability, they can expand theater commander options, and if produced in large enough numbers at low cost, they can allow the U.S. to sustain fighting and outlast the enemy. And this is a critical advantage in a great power conflict that could have levels of combat attrition not seen since World War II. The Air Force envisions operating these ACPs across a, actually a wide variety of missions. And probably if you've heard about this in the press, the attention has been mostly on teaming ACPs or collaborative combat aircraft with fighters. Um, but Gonzo and I focus this, this study on penetrating strike because it, it's so central to achieving strategic objectives under the National Defense Strategy. And it's also a deeply complex mission that provides a sandbox to examine the range of roles that ACPs might fulfill in a highly contested air environment, the kind of environment we might face in a war with China over Taiwan, for example. To get a closer look at the roles, missions, capabilities, and challenges ahead for ACP fielding, Mitchell Institute convened over 40 operators, engineers, and scientists from the Air Force, DOD, and industry. These are the experts who will champion the Air Force's vision to rapidly integrate ACPs into service force structure. They're literally the people that are designing this technology, operating it, and building the institutions, processes, and operations necessary to field it quickly. We brought these experts together for two and a half days and immersed them in a near-term Taiwan Strait scenario. We broke them into three teams and asked them to think about how they would incorporate ACPs into three distinct penetrating strike missions with varying geography and targets. We focused on a maritime strike mission, um, a search for mobile ballistic missile launchers in mainland China, and third, an air base attack on a Chinese bomber base. So everything you're about to see is not based on our opinion. These are the insights we gained from the experts we convened in the workshop who placed themselves in the shoes of mission commanders looking to identify the capabilities they would need to execute their penetrating strike missions and to understand how ACPs might fill critical gaps in those packages and contribute to an operational advantage. I don't wanna dwell on this slide, but I do wanna give you an overview of how we structured this workshop. So we brought all these people together and the first day was all about mission planning. Okay, here's your base force force, 2030 kind of force. Looks a lot like the force we have today. How would each of the teams design penetrating strike packages with no ACPs? Then we said, okay, where do you see potential gaps that you need to fill and how do you assess risk to mission? Next, we asked these teams to, to design their own ACPs, which they could do because they had a lot of operational experience and engineering background. So they designed nine ACP types for us and, we, and they added those to their force packages. So then at the end of the day one, we said, okay, how did risk to mission change once you introduce those ACPs into your force package? Then we threw those ACP designs over the fence for day two, where we convened a smaller cost assessment team. And these were technical experts that could assess both the feasibility of these ACP designs and also provide a very general rough order magnitude sense of their flyaway cost. Finally, on day three, we asked the, the experts to make a tough trade. We said, okay, you've designed these nine ACP aircraft. Now we want you to trade off some capability and reassess whether these ACPs still reduce risk to mission. So as you can see, when we started this, this whole event, <clears throat> experts initially, when they were building their packages without the ACPs, assessed risk to force as, risk to mission as being significant to high. Um, this is not surprising given how stressing these penetrating strike missions can be, but in fact, some of the experts even said that risk to mission was so high, they weren't sure a mission commander would order execution of the mission initially. Next slide. And here we can see why. This is a, a stoplight chart with a lot of red on it. And it sort of, it speaks to the specific gaps that the, the experts identified. None of these gaps are actually quite shocking. The Air Force has been talking a long time about its capability and capacity gaps, but they showed up in these penetrating strike vignettes as well. 
And so as you can see, lots of red for ISR to locate and track moving targets, very difficult to do in a dense and overlapping air defense environment, the kind we ex expect to see over mainland China. Next, command control and communications. Um, expert expectations were that communications would be certainly degraded if not denied. And counter air, uh, huge gaps here, particularly for suppression of enemy air defenses and escorting the bombers. It's all about survivability, and the experts were very concerned about minimizing task load on that bomber, getting bombs on target, and getting the bomber back the next day. So they need they were concerned about survivability. So how did experts design ACPs to actually fill the gaps they identified? Um, there's a lot here, uh, but just to back up and take the big picture view, um, we allowed the teams to design up to three ACP types. They didn't have to, though. A team could have come back and said, I just want one exquisite unmanned fighter jet. That's the only design I want. I want one exquisite unmanned bomber. I'm just going to build unmanned bombers. But nobody actually did that. The teams were far more interested in building larger numbers of diversified types of ACPs in relatively large numbers for the mission package. So if you look at this chart, they wanted anywhere between eight and hundreds of ACPs to supplement their penetrating strike packages. Their focus was really on bringing mass to the battle space and complicating adversary decision making by disaggregating capabilities across those ACPs. They also preferred simpler and smaller ACPs. If you look at some of the gross weights for these aircraft, they're relatively small. And we all know aircraft is cost by the pound. And there was a real drive, you know, let's keep costs low and get after capacity. And finally, and this is critical, um, the teams decided to design six out of their nine ACP types for counter air. And I, I think this really reinforces and speaks to the Air Force's, air Force's initial focus on building ACPs to support that air superiority mission. And of course, ISR was another key theme and jamming. And ISR in particular, there were some purpose-built ISR ACPs, but all these ACPs had and sensors on them to increase situational awareness. So how did risk change once these ACPs were introduced into the mix? So I, I told you that on the first day, risk was fairly high. And then, and you can see that in the first bar for each team. Day two, risk to mission declined significantly with the introduction of ACPs. But what's really interesting is what happened on day three. So remember I mentioned on day three, we asked these participants to trade out capabilities to see if they could get their costs even lower. And really the, the idea behind that was that we've heard from Secretary Kendall that a key attribute of these ACPs is actually that they are low cost. We want to be able to buy lots of them. And so a key question is, okay, if we trade off capabilities and get that cost down, do these ACPs still provide an operational advantage? The answer of these experts was a resounding yes. If you compare day one risk to mission and the third day, you see that risk to mission was still lower with the more modest capability types than they were when you just had a base force package with no ACPs. And one really important reason for that is that experts saw opportunities to trade off capability, but then take that extra reduction in cost and build up mass. So for example, there was a bomber team with that put synthetic aperture radar to track ground targets on about you know, 30 ACPs. Well, their decision was to take the SAR off of half of those ACPs, but then increase the number of the ACPs. And in this way, they felt they would be bringing more mass to the battle space and complicating adversary decision-making, uh, making the adversary unsure about which ACPs have what capabilities and forcing the adversary to expend rounds. And so in the end, they assessed that risk to mission was still lower than it would have been if the ACPs hadn't been there. So along the way, you know, clearly we saw that these ACPs can reduce risk to mission, provide an operational advantage and that the mass and spreading capabilities out was critically important. But Along the way of doing this workshop, we also stumbled on several big rocks or sort of issues that the Air Force and, and all the stakeholders in the ACP development will need to address as we move forward. You know, and this is not surprising. If you think about this really is next frontier technology. We're talking about introducing autonomous weapon systems into the battle space with artificial intelligence. And so, of course, there's going to be risks and also opportunities. And so as we came out of this, one of the big picture findings, I think, was to step back and say, hey, there is a lot of risk associated with building these things. But the answer from these experts is like, hey, don't throw up your hands and say it's impossible. The answer is actually to aggressively identify those risks and manage them. And in an effort to move that ball forward, we've identified some of those prob problems in need of further definition here. And arguably, the biggest one was autonomy. Um, we heard from the experts that they highly preferred very aggressive and and significant agrees of autonomy 
meaning they wanted these ACPs to more or less operate independently of a human. This was for about three different reasons. One, they wanted to increase um, decision speed. I no longer have to go back to the human to ask mother may I. Two was they didn't wanna rely on fragile data links that were likely to be jammed or denied in a contested environment. And three, they, wanted, they did not wanna task saturate air crews. Bomber crews would already be very busy during these missions. And, they, and, the, and from a mission commander perspective, they wanted the ACPs to go off and do their thing. So this kind of untethered concept of autonomy was very important to these experts. And, and they saw artificial intelligence as a real means to get there. So this is a potential opportunity. From a risk perspective, um, we had technical experts in the room and we asked them to assess technological maturity. They were unsure that even by 2030, we would have this high level of uh, uh, um, artificial intelligence that would allow for these autonomous operations. They were also unsure about cost. How do you cost the artificial intelligence self software? Is it a licensing agreement? How, how do you account for labor? And then of course, there are, are myriad policy issues and, and the issue of building trust between the operators and um, the technology. And so these are all seen as issues moving forward, not deal breakers, but things that um, need to be worked out as we go forward, particularly since from an operational perspective, the untethered concept was most attractive. And yet, because we know the AI isn't there yet, the Air Force is now moving on a crawl, walk, run approach where we're tethering the manned and unmanned system and evolving into that. So understanding more about what that path actually looks like will be really important. We also identified a number of other big rocks. I'm not gonna go into all of them. I encourage you to read the report, but one that I do wanna highlight concerns cost. This is very interesting. So on day two of the workshop, when we did a co the cost assessment, the big question was, how much do ACPs cost per pound? Well, historically aircraft for ISR and strike, for example, cost around $4,000 to $8,000 per pound. Pretty much everyone at the workshop, and I, I'm talking about industry and the Air Force, thought those numbers were too high. There are some real innovations happening now in aircraft design, manufacturing, and even sustainment, where experts were pretty optimistic that they could really break that cost curve and get down to something more like $1,000 a pound. That said, they were, they were pretty honest and upfront, acknowledging that while there were these innovations out there, they hadn't really been tested and these ACPs haven't been fielded yet. So we don't have the data to put this thousand dollars per pound in a cost model and know that it's right. And so the big answer there, as it is for many of these things, is to get these ACPs filled quickly and not into some you know, prototyping stage, not dwelling there, but actually out into a combat unit where we can get really accurate cost data, not, not just on the design piece, but also on the operations piece and the maintenance and sustainment piece. And that will tell us how, how we can sort of um, index that cost and will also give us lots of good data about the technology um, and how it needs to evolve to meet warfighter needs and how it can be integrated with TTPs and, and into the squadron. So coming back out of all this, you know, um, I mentioned that a big takeaway was that the, the teams really felt like large numbers of low cost ACPs could improve the Air Force's operational advantage and help to offset some of its major capability and capacity shortfalls. And they wanted their, their big takeaway though, was there are challenges ahead and it's important to step back and, and, and acknowledge that and aggressively manage it with open and broad communication with all the key ACP stakeholders. And to that end, these, that's what these first two recommendations are really about. Uh, the first recommendation we might wanna consider is for the Air Force to put out a flight plan that, that explicitly links ACP development to national strategy, particularly to the, the deterrence approaches of resilience and cost imposition. On a related note, and the Air Force is already making moves to do this, is feeling these ACPs quickly, not into prototyping units, out into combat units where they can immediately bolster deterrence, but also start teaching us real things about how these things need to evolve to meet operator needs. And that's a short-term issue, but it's also an institutional issue and a long-term, you know, looking at doctrine, training, organization, how the Air Force sets itself up to rapidly innovate even in a combat unit. And, and it can't be like Predator and Reaper where it took us 20 years to figure it out. We need to do this fast. On a related note, number three is about modularity. If you think you need to fly these things, fix them, fly them again, um, and update them constantly, these ACPs really need to be modular. They need to be able to accept new and different types of software. Four, you know, and this is just really reinforcing of the direction the Air Force is headed in. Large numbers, low cost ACPs, looking at the counter air mission set. And I would definitely add to that ISR because that was another enduring requirement. 
We also just got a pretty positive reaction to doing this unclassified workshop. A lot of people spend a lot of time doing serious and important work in classified arenas, uh, but stovepiped areas looking at these issues. And experts told us they saw a tremendous value in coming together, engineers, scientists, and, and operators, and working on this issue in an open setting. And as the Air Force looks to seek more resources for ACPs in 24, we could see potential value in having more unclassified workshops and war games that bring all these stakeholders together from DOD policy, the Hill, and um, <coughs> the wider in industry. Um, six, we do need to get after this cost assessment issue. What is the right cost per pound? And we need the data to prove it out. Seven was an interesting collateral finding. You know, we talked at the beginning about a family of systems for penetrating strike, and we spoke a lot about ACPs. But um, as Gonzo well knows, and he's written about this, munitions emerged once again as another key area. You can have all the right platforms. If you don't have the munitions with the right warhead size and range, you're out of luck. And we saw that especially with the air base attack team. They want to be able to punch hard but stand off a little bit. So we need new, better munitions and more, more of them. And finally, you know, ACPs hold tremendous promise to really offset some of the major force structure capacity shortfalls in particular that we face. But this is an additive requirement. The Air Force needs to preserve and continue building its high technology systems, but it also needs to supplement them with that mass. And so we'll need to work the ACP community and stakeholders, Congress, industry, and the Air Force will all need to really work together to figure out how to fund this so that it, it can go forward and make a lasting impact on our combat credible force. So in closing, I just want to thank you for joining us all here today. Uh, we saw a real consensus emerge around this idea that autonomous collaborative platforms really can offset some Air Force force structure shortfalls. And this is something all the key stakeholders um, need to get behind and continue pushing um, to improve our deterrence and warfighting capability. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks very much for that uh, overview, uh, Caitlin. Um, now let's jump right into the discussion. Uh, this first question that I've got is for anyone on uh, the panel, if they'd like to hit. We all just heard uh, Caitlin uh, talk about the consensus at the workshop. Was it large numbers of low-cost ACPs uh, could provide an operational advantage for penetrating uh, strike? Uh, could each of you or anyone who'd like to comment uh, give us some examples of the kinds of advantages that you see uh, ACPs providing for uh, critical Air Force uh, mission sets? So, uh, General's Dave Alexander, I jump in and get us rolling here. Uh, again, thank you, uh, General Deptula, for you know all you do and your team and Mitchell Institute, important work bringing everybody together. So. We're uh, pretty proud to be here and, and um, good job, Caitlin. So um, important capability for the ACP CCAs, um, you know, at the top of our list would be the uh, mission systems that are on board uh, to make sure they're adaptable, you know, as the threat changes and um, the mission changes. And that's really gonna start with, um, you know, advanced open architecture. Um, so that uh, we can bring in software defined payloads that can be changed, can be tailored for different countries and, and um, not be stovepipe for the future. I think that's gonna be one of the most critical things going forward. It's also gonna be one of the most critical things for defining the big part of the useful load that will also be the point design you know, later on for the, for the airframe. So anyway, you know, adaptable open architecture, software defined, payloads I think is going to be really key going on. Um, we all we all know autonomy is going to be a big part of this, but I, I would say um, dual enclave autonomy so that you don't get bogged down into the airworthiness um, quagmire. Um, one enclave is is a airworthiness with your autopilot in it and it's got a sanity checker so that you don't have a um, no offense but a you know a crazy pilot doing something you know, trying to drive an airplane upside down when he shouldn't. Um, so that's the airworthy piece of the autonomy and then the playpen or the mission system by the autonomy where maybe um, your AI and your ML sits and um, it's 95% of the autonomy is sitting there and you can move quick. You can bring it in and it didn't work. You can fly, fix, fly, you can change it. 
But if you put all that into airworthiness and go through that heel toe process, we'll be talking about this, in my opinion, 30 years from now and still not have it. So you got to be able to move quick with autonomy. And then, um, of course, meshing uh, that autonomy into, you know, one system, many aircraft acting as one, that's going to be huge, you know, and you can really fine tune a lot of that with, you know, um, adversary air and do that fight and fly, fix, fly. So those are kind of the, the key items up front. And then last, because, um, you know, you still got to fly this thing is the point design for the aircraft. But I think we have to have all that right before we get to that point design so we have the right speed, the right range, uh, the right useful load uh, going forward. Over. Oh, very good, Dave. Anyone else? Hey, General Deptool, this is uh, General Job. I'll, I'll jump in real quick, and then I, I, General White's probably got some comments based on what uh, Mr. Alexander just kind of laid out. I'd, I'd like to go back to um, the very beginning and say, hey, thanks for having us, by the way. This is a great opportunity, and we look forward to future engagements along these lines as we embark on this long journey of uh, kind of transforming the way we do business and the way that the Air Force is, is kind of built and the way we war fight. The nature of war has never changed, but the character of war certainly has, and we're adapting to that extremely rapidly. So we appreciate the opportunity. Um, I wanted to go back, uh, instead of reiterating what Mr. Alexander said, is talk about your consensus remark with the workshop that you had. I thought the, the report you guys wrote was very intriguing, very insightful, we appreciate that. Uh, along the lines of thinking about consensus, you know, as, as we embarked on this journey for Secretary Kendall, um, looking at and studying this problem, we brought in a large body of analytic work and assessment work that was across the entire Air Force with operators at the very beginning of this. And, and we've done and had multiple studies uh, done by independent groups finding similar conclusions to what you found. So I, I think we're all pointing in the same direction. So I think this idea of consensus and converging on this concept has got a lot of merit. We are very, very, very confident in our ability to both execute this and the war fighting efficacy that it brings to the table. We think there is a, in the parlance of the, the building, a lot of there there. And so we think there's a lot to be had in operational utility. I'll give you a couple examples. So as you guys looked at the different mission sets, I were very good. If, if you bring things like collaborative combat aircraft to bear, it enables your mission commanders to think about risk in a different way. Uh, it enables the combined forces air, co uh, air component commander to think about risk in a different way and to achieve the effects that the CFAC needs and wants and that mission commanders that can execute on the tactical edge really is a fairly unique game-changing capability. And then in the collaborative sense of things, you can do a lot of interesting tactics, techniques, and procedures that were born out in all of our operational analytics, both on the government side and the industry side. We've had a lot of industry partners do their own independent look on different mission vignettes and bring those to bear. And so on the, on the idea of consensus and the utility, we find utility across multiple mission sets and the idea of uh, being able to mitigate and manage risk in a different way was a very powerful finding on our side of things. And I'll turn it over to General White, see if he's got anything to address, over. No, thanks, General Job, uh, General Deptula, uh, Dr. Lee, Gonzo. Hey, thanks, great opportunity. And as General Job said, this is this is gonna be a discussion we'll have for a while because because we are taking our Air Force in a different direction. And, and the way of warfare has, the character of warfare has changed and we have to, we have to uh, de develop along with it. So a couple of things I'll say, I think that are critically important and I'll just kind of build off what General Job said is first of all, and even what Dave said, is the value of mod modularity, right? Um, and, and the openness from an architecture perspective, that's gonna be critically important. We're not looking for something that's going to limit us. It's gonna have to be something that can evolve and it can adapt based on the threat in near real time. And I think also along those same lines, and I think this is where Dave was going, and Dave and I have had many conversations on this front, is that ability to iterate. You know, I think Comac said in his comments at AFA, you know, we need to let the captains lead us through this, right? And so we don't want to get to a place where we overreach, where we believe we've we've mastered the art of the requirement. And instead, we want to basically use technology where we're at today, what we can reach towards, and then allow it to iterate as a function of time and as a function of trust, right? Because a lot of this is going to be, it's going to be built on the back of a term we, we often forget about called trusted autonomy. 
I trust that these systems are going to do what uh, they're, they're meant to do. And, you know, the secretary has said numerous times is we, we, we truly have to build on that front. And so we're spending a lot of time on that. That ability to iterate uh, is also it's also a function of early user involvement. Uh, that's one of the key things that the term operational experimentation, it's not really uh, that old of a term, right? It's it's a term that we've come out, uh, come out with as a function of time. And hey, we got to bring early user involvement to understand not only how are we going to use these things, but how are we going to iterate them as the fight continues and the threat continues to evolve? And then finally, that flexibility piece. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, we got to put the flexibility in the hands of the mission planner and the commanders on the ground to be able to use these capabilities to augment what crude assets we put in the fight. And so all of those things combine. And that's why it's so important. The, the teamwork we have with industry, the approach we're using with autonomy and the early user involvement are so critically important to, to how we approach this challenge. Over. General Abdul, Gonzo, very quickly, uh, two points. Uh, the first is no one in the workshop, which is really a mini war game, suggested that now this is the family assistance for long range strike. We need a different family assistance for counter air. No, these can be fungible across mission areas, have many of the same attributes, especially since they're modular. Another thing was no one suggested that some number of ACPs could reduce requirements for penetrating bombers, penetrating fighters, NGB for that matter. Rather, they saw them as additive and complementary. The real value proposition is figuring out how you best combine the attributes of both manned and uninhabited systems together to achieve decisive effects in the battle space. That's well said, Gonzo. And I, all of our um, analytics have borne out the same or similar result. So this is a, a partnering, and that's why the collaborative combat aircraft is such a key. It's, it's not just that these aircraft collaborate with each other, they collaborate with humans. And, and the, uh, the decisions to engage with lethal force that we're building into our design attributes and requirements are all supportive of American values, right? Of preserving life, minimizing uh, collateral damage, uh, achieving effects with the minimum cost to both blood and treasure. And that that's central to all the things we're thinking about. And so I agree with you hundred percent. We're, we're not re confining ourselves to one mission set. We think there's a lot of flexibility in these capabilities and, and I go from there. I did want to comment one thing, General Deptula popped into my skull while General White was talking. The other thing that I think is really interesting about how we are approaching this problem is really an organizational and teaming on the, on the people side. And so this is probably one of the first times you've seen in a, in a very long time where you have an operations lead, an acquisition technical lead, General White, and industry all at the same point, at the same time, developing capability across five major capability areas, uh, acquisition path, strategy, and partnering, uh, science and technology, bringing it out of the labs and into the war fight, uh, developing requirements, attributes that are flexible, fungible, and will develop rapidly over time, not locked into here's my range, here's my airspeed, here's my altitude. We're not approaching this problem like that at all. Uh, the resourcing path, we're already baking that in and building it from the ground up. And then the finally is that, you know, what we term as dot mill PFP, the doctrine, organization, training, materials, logistics, personnel, uh, facilities and policy. We are attacking all five of those capability areas as a team. And it's a pretty unique experience so far. As you'll see at any time, General White somewhere, 99% of the time, I'll be there right at his side, over. Oh, very good, uh, great points. Uh, Steve, comments? Yes, so all, it's, it's fascinating to me because what everyone on the team has spoken about is all the opportunities that exist and all of the ways that we can augment what we're doing, take advantage of saving lives and all those things. Another area that I think is fascinating here is that the constraints are different now, right? The constraints associated with manned operations, the constraints associated with the technologies that have been applied to manned aerospace and aviation, I think we can almost erase those and start over. And with a mindset like that, there's a, a horrendous opportunity space to even think about not just the systems themselves, but exactly how we would plan to conduct a particular mission or achieve a certain objective. And, and I just wanted to emphasize that I think opening up that thought space is, is a great opportunity. 
Very good. Okay, let's move on. Uh, Joe, Joe, we hear a lot from the Department of Defense about the need to speed new capabilities to the field to present a credible deterrent. Now, we know that the Air Force is interested in operational experimentation, that being the idea of fielding ACPs to combat units and then allowing the warfighters to experiment in a deployed setting. Uh, when, uh, and I know it's a pretty far, well, that's what the basis of the question is kind of out there, but when do you expect to see CCAs fielded with a combat units or at least a couple of them sent out to Nella so we can start doing some experimentation? You'll find this to be an unsatisfying answer because of the classified nature of it. I'm sorry, I apologize up front for that. Uh, I'll just tell you that um, we are going to move extremely fast. Um, and we are also uh, doing this in a threat relevant timeline. And so without giving specific dates to that and year groups, um, I'll just tell you that you're going to see us move fast. Uh, you'll, you'll probably be able to glean some insights when the 24 PB goes uh, to the Congress. I'm sure everybody could kind of decipher some of that at that point. Um, but we are, we're moving really fast. Um, and, and that's about as good as I can really get you to. And I'm glad you brought up Nellis because We've already been engaged with those folks. The, op the, the actual experts in war fighting tactics, we are, we are tied at the hip with them. And so they're witting of the things that we're doing and looking at it. Um, so I know it's an unsatisfying answer, but, but we're gonna move just as fast as we possibly can. Not, not to speed to failure, because we wanna make sure we get this right, but you're gonna see it in a fairly short order. It's not gonna be a traditional, you know, two years for anal analysis of alternatives and then go in and have a POM submission. And then we're gonna go out and do some prototyping. And then we're gonna reinvigorate the JSIDS process. And then we're gonna do a long EMD. And 10 years later, you're gonna see a capability. That's not the approach we're taking. This, this is gonna go much, much faster than that. And I don't know if General White, you have anything else you wanted to add, but that, that's our mindset right now without getting any specific timetables. over. No, I, I think the most important thing is, is that regardless of who you talk to on this line, whether it's industry, whether it's the requirements generation team with General Joe Leeds, or if Heather Pringle were here, General Pringle were here from AFRL, everybody on board from industry to the government, uh, all the partners are in and, and we understand the threat. And so we have to operate to that threat relevant timeline and that is going to drive what, what that speed is. But I will tell you what's critically important is you know, when we did the recent media roundtable, we had, this was a little more expanded, we had General Pringle with us, is we can't discount the work that's already been done in S&T with the Vanguard with Skyborg, and Steve Finley obviously is very aware of this, is we're not dismissing that. That's been a critical part of our journey, and so that exposure, that part of the process where we're already understanding what this means, and it's not just exposure to the, the CCA itself, but how does that CCEA operate on the existing ranges that we have, like some of the testing we're doing down at Eglin right now, right? And so we haven't stopped the Skyborg activity. We haven't stopped the continued relationship with S&T. And, and, and General Pringle has been very well integrated with the operational aspects and the acquisition aspects to pull it all together. And so I think because we've already done some of that foundational work, that transition directly over into something that is more operational experimentation related with, you know, really deep early user involvement with, with our folks out at Nellis and some of the other operational units, it's going to come, it's going to come fairly easily. No, actually, those are very satisfying questions. Yeah, we don't need a, you know, we don't need an exact date. That's not of concern, but uh, you evidenced a very clear, uh, predilection for doing this sooner rather than later. And, and that's, uh, I think, what's key. So let's turn to industry for a minute here. Dave and Steve, what's your take on how well we're positioned to move on uh, collaborative combat aircraft? How fast can you start producing them? And what are your thoughts on incorporating modularity uh, to enhance adaptability? Um. This is David, yeah, I'll, I'll jump in real quick here. So, you know, I think a key thing to moving fast is, um, you know, breaking up the systems and running in parallel as much as possible. And, and the, you know, the Skyborg is a perfect example of that. Um, you can start working on this autonomy, this dual enclave that, you know, I talked about that we're working on today. Uh, we can keep going on that while you're doing other things in parallel. You can, um, 
in parallel bring up your you know your advanced open architecture and uh, low band mid band high band start working on those and those could be flown on other platforms as well um so that you're not doing this whole serial uh schedule so that you know that being said um you know we believe two year cycles are are achievable um we also believe that uh if you can bring um you know this gambit series that we've been talking about so that you can you don't have to redesign everything if you want if you if you do need to change the oml or change the wings to add um, special low band sensors or whatever is in it that you can be a little more modular uh, with your airframe design as well so it's not a total redesign but you know i would say right now that uh, this is a quick answer two-year cycles but up front a lot of parallel work that's really needed get on the ranges get moving there's there's unmanned aircraft out there right now i won't say what what they are but that can continue on with that skyboard spirit that we have moving today over great steve yes sir so thank you general white for, for pointing out the skyboard elements we uh we act we obviously evolved the system quite a bit in skyboard learned quite a bit with that uh, as a part of that, and in addition to that, I mean, we're building about 150 jet, fairly high performance, call them high subsonic aircraft a year. So 150 in current production lines across multiple facilities. So the ability to to augment that, the, the processes are in place, the uh, our partners are in place, our subcontractors and suppliers in place. So our ability to throttle that a little bit and replicate that is is pretty good. I feel very comfortable that we can respond quickly as these systems evolve. And, and I think it's very key. And I believe everyone on the panel has made at least one comment about the, the necessity of an evolutionary process here. Get it in the hands of, of the warfighters, the operating personnel. They're gonna figure out how to employ these systems and how to optimize these systems certainly better than I can. And, and I think that's a very important part of it. But as that occurs, if we have existing systems in place that can produce the aircraft and that perform that in a manner where they already are modular because they're reconfigured for different missions that are being conducted even today, it enables you to swap out, and let's just use the case of a target system. You can swap out a, a payload that's intended to replicate a threat and change it for a payload that offers a threat. So I think we're well positioned. No, thanks for that. Let's uh, stick with our uh, industry uh, experts here for a minute. Um, uh, the invasion of Ukraine certainly highlights America's uh, war uh, wartime production uh, capacity shortfalls as well as export control regulations. Uh, production lines for some systems are quite frankly stretched to the limit. Uh, and so far, the current administration's not providing key capabilities uh, like the MQ-1C Gray Eagle to Ukraine due to concerns about exporting sensitive or revealing ex uh, sensitive technologies. Um, do you have a production capacity concern? Uh, and second part of the question is, do you think that the missile technology control regime is going to limit our CCA production capacity? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Steve. Thanks, Steve. Yeah. So, so on a production capacity, I, I think the the more basic and simple the systems are, I think the easier it is to ramp up the production capacity, and that's that's probably very logical. It makes sense. I think as the systems become more complex, it depends on whether that complexity is in the baseline system or aircraft, or whether that complexity is limited to let's call them modular um, payload systems, mission systems. And I think there's some trade space there to be considered. Certainly, the ability to produce these systems in mass in the, the smaller size ranges, and I'll key on that because if you look and, and tie this to MTCR now, if you look at what we've seen in the press, at least what I've seen in the press so far with respect to Ukraine, those have tended to be smaller systems. I think systems that generally would fit into CAT2 or, or, or simpler systems and lighter systems, not so much CAT1. So I think the MTCR CAT1 um, constraint, we talked earlier about constraints, I think that constraint would not play a big role in what's going on today in Ukraine, at least the way that that war is being being fought with Russia and Ukraine, and provides an opportunity for us to us, the whole US, to uh, 
to take advantage of and learn from those systems that are being effective that are at a lower cost range that are at a less restrictive range from a, from an export and uh, control regime theory. So I, I think there's there's quite a bit of opportunity there. So General, I um, I, I heard the question. I um, I hope I don't go down a rabbit hole here. Um, but the first thing is it's uh, okay. We'll let you know if you do. Yeah, all right, all right. Just tell me when I'm out in the soapbox too much here. But um, you know, the FMS process it is way too slow. We have got to fix that. Oh my God, that, maybe that's another panel for another day. But, yeah. Um, if we if we think we're going to start doing things with other nations, we got to start with that first. Um, anyways, sorry about that. Um, but it's important, to, I think, to keep uh, the program uh, common. So programmer record common, if you're gonna share, so that you're all you know, doing the same thing, not building something separate. And, and so I think that would be an important feature if we're gonna go and team up and into production. Uh, it's important right up front to have the protection built in for you know, anti-tamper for CPI and and um, you know encryption and all that from the get-go. Don't try and put it in later. Um, speaking from experience, it's, it's not easy doing it after the fact. So let's have that up front. And then, um, like I was saying before, software-defined sensors and all that would really allow us to do tailoring, you know, per country. If there's things we don't, if we don't want to share everything. Um, so anyway, but to the MTCR. You know, I think the speed of this aircraft will be way over this 800 kilometers per hour, um, more like 550 knots, you know. Um, so I really think it's going to end up getting Cat 1. Um, and once it hits Cat 1, you know, how do you share production on these things and do production in other countries? There's all kinds of limitations there. I think we got to kick out of the way if we're going to join together and build these things. So right now, if it, I'm pretty confident we're gonna hit it cat one by these design points that we're talking about and speeds, and it's gonna put roadblocks up for us all going into production together off of one common design. And if everybody goes for a long pass and designs everything different, it's, I don't think we've gained anything out of it. Um, so anyway, those, those are my thoughts. You know, I'm just really worried about the, you know, the FMS process being slow. And then, of course, you know, Congress can stop things dead in their tracks, too, as you go along. Um, but like I said, maybe that's a panel for another day. But um, no, Dave, I think you bring up yeah. some excellent points. I think there are a lot of people that recognize them. I mean, uh, one of the most important people who do recognize these uh, bureaucratic uh, and process uh, imposed restrictions is the chief of staff of the Air Force, who's made this uh, one of his priorities to try to change. The problem is the big frozen middle. Uh, yeah. And you're right, we could have another panel on this, but let's move in, move on. <laughs> Thank you for that perspective. Let me ask General White, um, the Air Force's vision for ACPs um, seeks to introduce affordable capacity into the force structure. Um, and I know that, you know, I'm, I'm offering you this question from a broad perspective, uh, and it's going to depend, uh, but can you give us sort of a ballpark sense of how much these things might cost uh, and some of the innovations that were mentioned here earlier that might res reduce uh, the cost of building these things? Yeah, a couple things. You know, I think we really, really get caught up in the cost, first of all, and we're, everybody's looking for a number, right? And I will tell you, I'm not sure that's exactly the way you want to go about it. We understand the number is going to drive the decision space, but what variables do you use? What things are you trying to do that's going to define what that number is? I think that's where we need to spend some of our time and some of that analytical work to determine you know, where the knee of the curve is. What does affordable mass mean? How much attritable is attritable enough? Those are some of the things, but at the end, I think what we have to do is we have to we have to completely dissect the mission set, understand what we're asking these things to do, and then at the same time try to bake in that cost imposition piece. And you know, if you one of the things that I've said over and over again about CCAs, and this is about most things, right? This is not new. This is not novel. As complexity increases, speed to ramp goes down. 
that's just the reality. If you want speed to ramp to increase, you're going to have to bring complexity down. And obviously, there's a cost element to that as well. And so we're keeping that very much out in front of us. I will tell you, though, the two pieces I think that are most critically important. You know, the secretary has said, you know, he's basically made the comment, I think, on numerous occasions, he would expect this to be about half the cost of a crewed aircraft. And I think at one point there was even, uh, I read something recently that even compared it to half the cost of a of an F-35. You know, those are some of the those are some of the bounds people are putting on it. But but I'll, I think there's danger in that, right? Because then you start building to an expected number when reality is is what you need to do is be building to a capability, and then you need to decide whether or not that number is is too high, and it doesn't build in that cost and position you want. And so that's we're really letting the analytics take us in the right direction. But I will tell you, affordability is a driving factor to this um, because we know that that cost and position as it's presented in the national defense strategy is a critical part of making this whole CCA mission set work. However, uh, one thing that General Job and I talk about a lot, and I think this is critically important, is we can't lose sight of the fact cost and position is important, but we got to have the ability to provide those options to that mission planner and that commander on the ground to say, okay, this is how I'm going to use it. This is how I'm going to employ it. And I'm going to make a decision that maybe it, it doesn't come back. And so maybe this system doesn't have the normal protective measures you would see on a crewed aircraft, right? And so I think that's the way we're approaching the problem. As we start getting more into the, the, the discussion of the budgets rolling out, we're going to have probably a, a greater conversation about what that number looks like. And I don't think we should fix that number either. That's the other thing. It's not going to be just a single number because, again, there may be some times you're going to want some of these systems to be a little more complex and a little less attributable. But at the same time, as you provide that flexibility to the commander on the ground, you're going to want to make sure you have that ability as well. And so it's all about the variability we put into that. And so I'll ask General Job. I know there, there is an operational component to this conversation. It's not just a cost component. It's making sure we have that flexibility into the hands of the commander. So, General Job, anything you want to add there? Yeah, I think that was a, a great starting point on it. <clears throat> I think uh, what we're examining is a whole host of return on investment Pareto frontiers across multiple aspects of the platform, from the fundamental aircraft itself to mission system integration to modularity to return on investment from an operational return on investment. And so what does that all look like? We're examining all that trade space. You can probably fairly simply with a, a a piece of paper and a pencil, draw some boundary conditions, right? I mean, if we're going to do an offensive counter air mission that, you know, represents us doing an, an, an offensive look, that's probably a certain class of vehicle with a certain kind of engine with certain kind of altitudes, you could probably go, all right, I know a lower boundary, but then there's a lot of trade space above that. Um, assured communications, mission sensors that are going into that. How do we, we partner up? So there's a lot of flexibility in that. And then you probably hit an upper boundary limit where it just gets so expensive, it doesn't meet the affordable mass or affordable capacity boundary. So that probably doesn't make a lot of sense. So we're examining all of those. But at the end of the day, what we want to make sure we provide is, you know, as, as I continue to look at the picture of you and your son, Gerald Deptula, is when your son's out there on that leading edge and he's force packaging up and he's going to count on a large swarm of CCAs to show up, if they don't show up because of reliability problems, we got the cost too low, right? We cannot put our airmen and guardians and, and soldiers, sailors, Marines in that position. And we, we need to talk about the joint force and the partners again, if we, if we get a chance in this panel or in a future one. They've got to have the confidence these are going to show up, not rotate on takeoff if it's a land-based unit and auger in with weapons on board. That's not what we want. And so there's a lot of trade space and we're looking at all of those factors um, as we kind of move forward. Over. Yeah, no, thanks very much for those answers. I would only just uh, elaborate a bit in, uh, in General White, as you were speaking, I'm thinking cost per effect. I mean, that's something that we have to continue to pound into folks in OSD and in Congress in particular, because, you know, buying these things isn't like going to the grocery store and, and trying to decide between, you know, cans of beans and which one is the lowest cost. Uh, the issue is, you know, what is the cost per desired effect? Uh, and then compare that. And obviously, as you all have mentioned, it's gonna depend on what you're asking the particular vehicle to do. They're not all gonna do the same thing. So um, very good. Let me uh, thank yeah, you let me, all. Let me, 
let me yeah. respond to that real quick. I think you're on to something, Drill Dev Tool. You know, it's there has to be that discussion about the lethality for the dollar, right? And we get very fixated on the cost per unit. Well, in this particular case, each unit may not be asked to do the same thing. So again, that's that variability we're talking about. And then General Job, you know, the, talked about the resilience. You know, you're going to have to bake resilience into these platforms and even think about how you test that resilience, right? Because if you have a warfighter on the other end expecting these things to deliver a certain effect, you need to be able to deliver on that effect. And so that's how, exactly how we're looking at the problem, building in that resilience and then trying to understand that lethality for the dollar aspect over. No, very good. And, and again, thank you all for your responses. What I'd like to do now is open this up to questions from the audience um, who've been listening. Um, we, we've got several in the Q&A uh, lineup, but you can also use the raise hand function on the app as well. Um, so while we're waiting for folks, if you want to raise your hand, um, let me kick off with a good one from uh, Glenn uh, Cooler. Um, how are CCA requirements lined up with agile combat employment? Right. I'll take that one. I'll take that one. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah. Oh, no, sorry. You go first. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would say um, that's part of our initial looks in the design is to have flexibility in, you know, what kind of um, launch and recovery conditions you have. Uh, so there's a, a lot of look into that that feeds into agile combat employment. Um, and, and across the joint force, right? There's, there is potential here for us to do things in a much, much different way than, you know, standard 8,000 foot runway. So we're not looking at it that way. We're looking at this from different um, ways of launch and recovery. And I, I know Dr. Lee and Gonzo's paper kind of talked about, hey, you might have an air launched variant. You may have a rail launch variant. You may have a traditional runway variant. There's lots of opportunity there. But we are certainly building into the initial requirements attributes, the ability to be agile, to have a minimum logistics footprint so that we can actually get into the fight and sustain the fight in a meaningful way. Um, and there's a whole discussion to be had on the life cycle of these things and how we build the overall force structure of them. You know, there's a lot of potential to have a fleet that you buy of a certain size and a lot of that fleet is really only used for combat operations, right? You may do, you do the day-to-day -day things that you need to do for readiness, but a lot of them may stay packaged up and ready for war in a very small containerized fashion. We're working through all those and Mr. Alexander, I'll pass it over to you over. Yeah, thanks. So I, I just uh, say the same, but um, really, really important feature is, you know, it's a, especially in the Pacific, there's uh, the distances are so fat um, bass that if you don't embrace agile combat employment, I think you've got issues, you know, and if you start saying, well, I'm going to solve them with tanking, uh, now you got a whole nother set of issues. So I really think it's a key part to where we're, um, where we're going with keeping the whole system low cost, affordable and flexible. So stay away from air to air refueling and uh, make, make it, you can do island hopping. It's, um, that's the way we can make these things effective in mass quantities, over. Thanks, here's one from uh, Michelle uh, Villeneuve. Um, it's a great question. And her question is, what's the difference between ACPs and CCAs and capabilities? It seems like they can both reach the same targets contested environments. Are ACPs fully autonomous? It's a good question because uh, there's been some confusion that's been introduced by some of these new terms. The bottom line is autonomous collaborative platforms is sort of the parent descriptor of which collaborative combat aircraft is a variant. Okay. Uh, and I think it's a, uh, it's important to understand that descriptor. So um, ACPs are kind of the, the general terminology, collaborative combat aircraft or a subset. Um, <clears throat> so um, I hope that uh, clears that up, uh, uh, Michelle. General um, DePillo, we have a good graphic in the report in description of uh, ACPs, CCAs. So you can see the whole the family of uh, ACPs in there for different missions. Okay, thanks, Gonzo. Um, here's another good question. Why? Is there a recommendation for the development of new weapons? What's the relationship between new weapons and ACPs? 
Fantastic question. And in fact, I think your report kind of teased that out and Dr. Lee briefed that at the beginning in the overview. So we are, we are not um, decoupling ACP requirements, attributes of development capabilities from our weapons requirements. We are integrating those two pass forward because um, any affordable mass you have, both with kinetic and non-kinetic effects, has got to incorporate what those kinetic and non-kinetic effects are, right? Um, probably a, a little simpler to incorporate electronic warfare or electro electromagnetic spectrum operations just based on the technology than it is to incorporate different missiles. And because all of those are very complex with different uh, fit out requirements, size, weight uh, for propulsion and so on and so forth. So we are we are looking at both of those together. And so um, our, our look initially is obviously to build early days to have, you know, marrying up our current weapons, but then our future weapons are also looking at how we would marry up a ACP or combat collaborative aircraft of the future with our weapons. So uh, they are both coupled together and they're not completely delinked in the early days. You'll probably see a lot of traditional, how do I integrate the weapons that we do have? Because if you're going to go speed to ramp, you, you've got what you got now. Uh, but future weapons development capability will incorporate uh, CCA designs over. No, uh, Lifter, you've got what you've got now is exactly uh, right. We did not give the teams that played the war game a, a whole bunch of new capabilities, new weapons, and that would the purpose, which was to stress what kind of ACPs might help reduce risk. So the air base attack team in particular were using direct attack weapons to strike targets on a uh, uh, PLA Air Force uh, bomber base, A6 bomber base. That does not make sense from an operational perspective because that can bring our stealth bombers too close in to uh, threats surrounding that air base. That's why you did not see the risk drop when you had ACPs because they didn't have the right kind of weapons. The team said, if we had a little bit more standoff, you know, 30, 40 nautical miles, and the weapons with that kind of standoff to attack that air base, that risk would have come down significantly. So it is a family assistance approach to long range strike, which includes not just ACPs, but weapons. Line between the two is getting thinner and harder to see every day when you introduce loitering munitions into the mix, I would add. Okay, here's one from uh, Sean Cochran. When evaluating variation in risk to mission, how do you conceptualize and assess PLA countermeasures and defenses versus these systems? I'll probably take a swing at that one. Um, so what we've done is we used several different time epochs and the intelligence community uh, understanding of the current threat and what we assess the threat of the future to be in all of our analytics. And so we run multiple iterations through our model sim analysis process and operational analytics to incorporate what we think counter capabilities would look like. So all of those are foundational to, to our, our an analysis as we've gone into key attributes, um, requirements and design features as we're doing this capability development. Is it, a, is it a perfect answer? It's never a perfect answer looking into the future, right? Um, I don't know what anybody thinks the housing market will look like in 2030, but uh, it's probably different than it is today, especially in the Washington DC area right now. But we do our best with a consensus across the Intel community and, and operators to come to what we think is a realistic assessment of the future threat in different time epochs. And we're now basing our capability development based on those results. Is that fair? Very good. Anyone else want to chime in on that one? Um, I think Gonzo may want to add to this, but I just want to say for our for our exercise, we gave the teams a red bed down that approximated what we think red will look like in about 2030. And at the unclass level, we all know huge number of coastal air defense systems to deal with, and as well as these cruise and ballistic missile threats. This is just at this point unclassified common knowledge. Um, so we didn't have a dynamic red thread, but the teams had to account for. Uh, cruise missile capabilities, jamming capabilities, and to consider that in their design. I also think it's important in our next workshop that uh, we're thinking of playing a red so we can get that interaction between the blue and the red teams and say, uh, how would you counter this kind of capability? All right, how would you address that new risk and so forth? As uh, you said, General, you need that uh, those insights. And it did shape how they designed the ACPs. Going back to this ACE question, 
No one wanted to put these things on a runway more than 5,000 feet. Everyone was looking for runway alternatives. They wanted to disperse these ACPs to distribute risk. So they were looking at air launch. They were looking at rocket. They were looking at just dirt roads or just civilian runways, anything to get out of the mob. Okay, well, everyone, we've uh, come to the end of our rollout today. Uh, Caitlin, Gonzo, General Job, General White, Dave and Steve, thanks so much for sharing your insights. Um, I think uh, everyone found them uh, very uh, 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 informative. And for all of our participants, you can find a copy of today's paper in the publication section of our website, mitchellaerospacepower.org. So with that, from all of us at the Mitchell Institute, have a great aerospace power kind of day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.